you mentioned the border a few times. Yeah. Uh, I had Tim Kennedy on last week. He said he could literally see people walking over. Basically, Border Patrol is very well-dressed, uniformed version of Uber for these illegal immigrants. They were looking for Border Patrol. They what? wanted... Uh, that That surprised me, too. <laughs> These people are coming in, they're claiming asylum, in many cases, years in the future, and they get a plane ticket to go wherever they want in the country. All right, guys, we got Tulsi here today. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. There's Good to be here. a lot going on. Yeah. I was going through your Twitter and holy crap, you're dealing with a lot right now. <laughs> yes. Between the quiet sky stuff, the Biden administration after you. Yeah. What's going on right now? Yeah. Uh, that's a good place to start. <laughs> um... You know, uh, I was listening to Kamala Harris's acceptance speech last night at the Democratic Convention, a lot of the other speeches, and it was very ironic that they were talking about freedom. Mm. Uh, this this kept up this theme of freedom. The theme of the night is freedom. But when you look at what they're actually doing, what they've been doing over the last three and a half years in the Harris-Biden administration, it has been undermining our freedoms. And so as I was watching that last night, I was like, oh, interesting. You're talking about freedom and you're going to be the president who's going to uh, uphold freedoms in America. <laughs> and yet I am personally experiencing, and I'm not the only one, but I am personally experiencing political retaliation because I exercise my right to free speech. Mm. So you you mentioned this whole thing, uh, the, the quiet skies. A lot of people probably never heard of it, but it's a secret domestic terror watch list that uh, is administered by the TSA. And long story short, the very next day, uh, President Biden announced that he was dropping out of the race and endorsing Kamala on July 21st. Mm -hmm. July 22nd, I did an interview on Laura Ingram show on Fox News saying Kamala Harris as president would be very dangerous for our country for many reasons. And I talked about what some of those reasons were. And July 23rd, my husband and I were traveling and we started uh, what would turn out to be uh, the first of many, many flights of in-depth so-called random security checks by TSA. Mm -hmm. uh, our boarding passes, you couldn't check in online. Wow. Boarding pass is like, due to government regulations, you must get your boarding pass from the ticket counter. Really? You go to the ticket counter, you get a boarding pass, and it has this uh, four S's on it. They call it the quad S. Mm. That means when you go, pre-check doesn't work. You can go stand in line, get to the TSA checkpoint. They look at it, call the supervisor, say, we have a quad S here. They have to shut down an entire screening lane Wow! at TSA. This is the same in every airport. Uh, shut, shut down an entire lane. So we're, wait, you know, 10, 15 minutes for this to happen. And then uh, they spend the next 30 to 45 minutes. They do like a 10 minute long in-depth pat down of, of you, of, of me and my husband in this case. And then they they go through and swab every single item in your carry-on for explosive uh, residue before they let you go through and, and go to the gate. And then sometimes uh, we, we had to go through it again at the gate before we were allowed to board the plane. Wow. And so this went on. You know, sometimes this happens. They say, oh, this is a random selection. Hmm. Okay, once, maybe twice, but third flight, fourth flight, fifth. And I travel a lot. Like, I'm on a plane probably two or three days a week on average. Right. So... Uh, it wasn't until about a week later that air marshal whistleblowers came forward and said, hey, here's the proof. They took a, a picture of their their uh, mission brief targeting package showing mm. that I had been added to this Quiet Skies domestic terror watch list, which for them required them to surveil and watch me from the time I got to the airport, onto the plane, through the flight, and all the way out to my car or Uber or whatever vehicle I was getting into in my destination. That's insane. And um, so so this is this is one of many different issues and, and many different examples of many different secret terror watch lists, the weaponization of law enforcement, the national security state that has happened under Joe Biden and Kamala Harris just over the last three and a half years going after specifically political opponents. They'll send the IRS after you mm. if you speak up too loud. They'll send... Uh, uh, there was an FBI agent who was like, hey, we shouldn't be sending SWAT teams out to go and kick down doors of peaceful pro-life protesters in the middle of the night. That's what's happening. Mm. And because this guy stood up and said, hey, the FBI is being biased politically to go after opponents of the Biden-Harris administration, 
They took away his top secret security clearance, put him on unpaid uh, suspension for an undetermined period of time, just uh, within a few weeks after uh, him him speaking up. Mm. Uh, there, there are so many different examples of this, but it all comes down to the hypocrisy that we should be <laughs> very clear-eyed about in doesn't matter what Kamala Harris says or these people say. They can say they believe in freedom and they'll stand up for freedom, but we got to look at their actions because their actions tell not only a very different story, it is the opposite. Right. That's scary. So they've weaponized these agencies against people they, they, they want to go after. And you have, like, even with the FBI, you have... Um, the, this guy, for example, his name is Terry Turchi. He was the very first head of counterterrorism in the FBI. Mm. One of the OGs who served in the FBI for over 30 years, frontline guy. He has come out and said publicly that the FBI has essentially become a police agency for the Democratic Party. Wow. And he's not the only one saying these things. There are more and more people coming forward and pointing out and exposing the truth about exactly that, that mm. this isn't just a talking point, the weaponization of these agencies to go after political opponents. People who are in these agencies are just saying, you know what, enough is enough. This is not what I signed up for. Right. So something needs to be done here. This is... that, And that that's really what is at the heart of uh, what's at stake in this election, though, mm. is, um, or, you know, do you want to see more of this? Do you want to see a continued weaponization of our, our own government against political opponents of those in power? If you do, Kamala Harris is your person. <laughs> and we will lose the, the, the heart of who we are as a country in that case, which is that foundation of freedom that's enshrined in the Constitution. And we will increasingly look, feel, and experience more of what it's like to live in uh, a banana republic, these countries where whatever political party is in power— will use all of their power to go after their political opponents. Mm. That's not that's not a democratic republic. That's not who we are uh, as a country. Right, and we both grew up Democrat, and it's gone exactly. such a far away from what it used to be, right? <laughs> it, it, it's unrecognizable. It's unrecognizable. And, and I, there are a lot of people like us who either, you know, grew up as a Democrat. For me, I did, and my parents were pretty nonpartisan growing up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm the fourth of five kids who are homeschooled. And they told us, like, hey, you you figure out your own path. You make mm -hmm. your own decisions and think through things, pros and cons. And and so I chose to join the Democratic Party back in, um, in 2002. Mm -hmm. And it was because of what the traditional Democratic Party had stood for uh, for a long time, the party of JFK, the party of Martin Luther King, the party that believed in freedom and civil liberties uh, believed in welcoming people with different views, different backgrounds, different religions. Hey, let's all come together around, around you know, making Martin Luther King's dream a reality. Um, and it's you know, it, to to say the party has gone downhill is is an understatement. It's it's gone, uh, like I said, it, it's it's completely unrecognizable. And unfortunately, it's not just a matter of like, oh well, we disagree on health care or we disagree on you know, how to tackle the our failing education system in this country. We're dealing with, and this is what I wrote about in my book, um, sounding the alarm bells because we have people in power in the Democrat elite right now who do not believe in the Constitution. Mm. And the Constitution, obviously, is this is our, our foundation. It's, it's the framework for our country that establishes fundamental basic rights that are guaranteed to every one of us as Americans. And, and the construct of limited government and uh, individual liberty. Right. If we have people in power, as we do now, who swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution and yet spend all of their time trying to destroy it and take away our rights, we cannot allow them to be in power. And, and that's where when we say things have to change, yeah, absolutely things have to change we have to recognize, I don't care what party you belong to, this affects all of us. Right. Because just because they're in power today, if this is the new norm and the new precedent, what happens next? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, well, this is just what happens now in America, and we, we can't allow that to happen. Mm. And the only way we stop them, and, and yeah, I'm filing lawsuits, and we'll fight this in the court of law because it's illegal and unconstitutional what they're doing, mm -hmm. 
but we have to hold them accountable at the ballot box and send those who don't believe in freedom, don't believe in the Constitution, don't believe in civil liberties, send them home. Yeah. We can't allow them to be in power because it's a dangerous thing. Absolutely. You start to wonder how long this has been going on because a lot of it's getting exposed now yep. from people like you, Tucker Carlson and Candace Owens. Yeah. But you really it's wonder, not new. Like, it's certainly, so? you know, it's certainly not new. And I go into some of the historical examples. Um, and, you know, there are, there are examples under President George W. Bush mm. that we can look to in some of those uh, violations of civil liberties and, and weaponization of the government. We can look to... Uh, under President Obama, how uh, he used the IRS at that time, just one example, uh, to specifically, and, and they had to publicly apologize for this because they were caught. Oh, wow. And there were millions of dollars of settlement fees that were paid out because the IRS had flagged uh, key words that specifically targeted conservative nonprofit organizations. Whoa. Specifically. Uh, the fact that there was some accountability through the courts in that measure was a good sign mm -hmm. because it said, okay, well, you're you're not going to be able to get away with this, but but it's continuing on today. So it's, it's nothing new, but it's reached a level to me that has become so brazen. Uh, they're not even trying to hide it anymore uh, because they think that they they can get away with it. And that, that's that's a problem. Yeah, that is. Do you think Kamala will back out of this debate coming up? Uh, I don't think she will. I don't think she can. Mm. Uh, I, I think it would uh, be devastating to her if she were to back out of it. You think so? Yeah. She's not, not doing any interviews, so. I don't know how long she can get away with that. <laughs> when you have even, when you have like CNN and some of these other guys talking to her campaign people and just being like, okay, come on. Like she has been essentially the, the Democratic nominee, the presumptive nominee, at least for over a month now. Right. Um, or maybe almost a month. And she has not done like a serious interview. She has not held a single press conference. I know it's been over 30 days. And, I, I you know, if, if the mainstream propaganda media that has been kind of boosting her up this whole time is now saying like, OK, you got you got to give us something. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think she'll be able to get away with it. I think they're going to try to keep her away from any unscripted conversations and interviews for as long as they possibly can mm. because they know what we've most of us have seen over the last few years is is unless she is um been given a script by her pollsters and her advisors and the people who are crafting the policies around her right uh she doesn't make a whole lot of sense agreed and they're trying to pay off these celebrities to be the face but i don't think that's going to work this time yeah are like, they paying them off? Yeah, at the DNC, there was a couple of rappers that went and spoke and or sang. Were whatever. they paid to be there? I'd assume so, right? Yeah, I'd I be don't surprised know. If they weren't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think Trump <laughs> should take the same approach with this debate as he did with Biden, or do you think he should say some different things? I think he should. I, I think the debate with Biden was very effective. Um, he, President Trump, was very disciplined and focused on issues, and comparing and contrasting. Um, his record with with Joe Biden's record. The thing with Kamala Harris is, you know, they're trying to make out like uh, she doesn't have a record. Mm. Um, even I think the New York Times had a recent article saying, hey, voters shouldn't expect any detailed policies from Kamala Harris because she just started her campaign. She doesn't have time <laughs> to come up with detailed policies. I'm like, hold on a second. Where have you been for the last three <laughs> and a half years? She's been the vice president of the United States of America. Are you telling me that she was a blanks, like she did nothing? Right. She crafted no policy. She had no thoughts of her own. And that she and President Biden, who up until very recently were running for re-election, they had no plan mm. for the next four years. But this is this is the point. The mainstream media, and they, they are essentially her propaganda arm. And they're trying to lower expectation people like, hey, you know, look, she looks happy. That should be enough, right? <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Uh, and, and and prepare for the fact that you know her. Uh, she she doesn't have um, the depth in understanding the seriousness of the issues that we're facing. And and quite frankly, to me, you know, they're like, oh, she's the joyful candidate. She's a joyful warrior. This is this is kind of the theme that all of the media is using around her. And 
to me, it's 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 insulting mm. because as Kamala Harris is joyful and laughing, there are more people living in poverty today than the very first day they took office. Right. There are more people who are struggling just to buy groceries and pay for gas today because of their economic policies than they were before they took office. Mm. There are more people getting injured and hurt with crimes being committed in our streets today than before they took office. We have millions more illegal immigrants in our country today than before they took office. By every single metric, we are facing greater challenges that are impacting people's everyday lives who are struggling, and yet Kamala Harris is laughing. Right. What an insult. It's terrible. Did you see they just faked the unemployment percentages? I did, again. It's, it's, it, the, <laughs> I'm glad that this is coming out now, mm. but, but it, it is yet another example and illustration of um, the fact that there, there are no limits to what they will try to get away with in order to, to stay in power and yeah. to get elected. And the crazy part is nothing will happen to them no. for doing that. No. No crimes. Well, th- not only no crimes, but you know, what, what's, what's the coverage? I mean, Fox News is covering it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I might. I saw maybe a little headline here or there. I saw it on Truth Social. That's about it. Right, <laughs> right. And so, why isn't it the front page news of every single newspaper? You know that if it if that happened under Donald Trump, it would be headline after headline mm-hmm. after headline after headline. Or if it was anybody but them, the Democrat elite, right. because it's not because it's Kamala Harris now, and they they really want her to win, and they being her friends in the media, her friends in big tech, and you know, all of their big donors and, and the, the national security state, the, all of those who benefit by her and the Democrat elite remaining in power, they're going to make sure that these kinds of things just like, let's let's just slip that under the rug and hope that people are not paying attention. Right. What do you think the fix is to fixing the media industry? Because I know Elon's doing a great job with Twitter. He is doing a great job. And I, I hope that he continues to be successful so that those in business and in the private sector who are are actually interested in running a good business um, will see that that that's what we as voters want. Mm-hmm. Um, you know the 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 you know CBS, ABC, NBC, all these guys. You know they're very cozy with with the Democrat elite, and uh, they have made that choice to essentially uh, put their bias in that direction. Uh, what we can do about it is like turn the channel, mm. don't watch, don't pay attention, uh, because really it is our te- our attention and our time that is um, the currency right. uh, that they need and that we have uh, that we control. Mm-hmm. And so how you know okay well what which social media platforms are you going to use and or uh, you know you going to watch uh, cable news or you going to listen to podcasts or where where we put our attention is how we can send a very strong message that we're not interested in their propaganda. Right. Their viewership must be hurting because I don't know anyone in my generation that watches yeah. traditional news anymore. Right. Or even has cable news. Right. Like podcasts are getting way more views. I agree. So it's good. are changing. It's good. I think it's a step in the, in, in the right direction because like for me, I, I can listen to podcasts from people who have a lot of different views on different issues and you get a better idea of like, okay, well, here's the pros and cons on this. Mm without having to be, con- and, and people are generally like, okay, I know where you're coming from. So you're not wondering like, okay, well, whose who's, um, bias has this person adopted? And so then it, it allows us to be better critical thinkers and come up with our own positions and our own conclusions ourselves, which is the way it should be. Right. Has Twitter changed the world of politics a lot? I think it has. I, I think that in a lot of ways, Donald Trump's use of Twitter mm-hmm. back in 2016 um, changed everything mm. in in politics when it comes to social media. Because you know we were, we were using Twitter and Facebook and all all of that before then, but uh, the way he used Twitter um, to to speak directly to the people and not be filtered by any media entity. I think that was the game changer. Right. And and of course, you know, obviously later he was banned from Twitter, banned. I think he was banned from Facebook, Facebook. and Instagram. Uh, and so he created his own truth social because he needed a platform mm-hmm. and he understood the power of speaking directly to the people. Uh, so it really, I think it it really democratized our, um, 
our expectations of of how we can hear from directly from those political leaders. And so it took it took away from the actually I don't want to say it took away from, but it added to the traditional like, okay, they're gonna have a White House press conference or there's going to be an address by the president from the Oval Office, which is a big deal. It's a right. serious thing. Um, those things should still continue in my view. But when you're talking about that direct communication platform, um, I think that was the game changer. And obviously uh, Elon buying Twitter and yeah. reshaping it to be really what is the only major free speech platform uh, and, and that he's sticking to it mm-hmm. is, is, a, is a massive deal. It's the only one where I'm not shadow banned. Wow. Yeah. Instagram, my views are down 80%. Yeah. I posted a photo with Trump Jr., I've been down 80% since that photo. Really? Yeah. They have an algorithm tied to his face. Oh I know a few gosh. other people that have posted photos yeah. with him. Their views go down like crazy. Yeah. So nuts. Same thing with Tate. If you post yep. him on TikTok or anywhere, he just got arrested again. It's crazy. Yeah. There's, it's there's... happened to me a bunch of times on Instagram where you just start, to, like, you know, if you pay attention, you're like, oh, interesting. Yeah. Like, what, and and for me, I don't know, There's there's been different posts. There was one, uh, Oh gosh, I don't even remember now. It's happened so many times, but I remember like, okay, it was this post that did it, even though they won't tell you mm. exactly right. what it is. Was it with a certain person, or it was either some kind of um, topic headline? It may have been with a person. Sometimes it's just like, you know, I I I compete in this new sport called the tactical games, which is mm-hmm. like CrossFit style or high intensity workouts combined with. Um, like shooting oh, under wow. high physical stress. That sounds cool. It is. It's a lot of fun. I gotta check I that highly, out. You should. You definitely should. But when I post pictures of that, usually like just posting a picture uh, with a firearm will immediately really cause things to take a nosedive. That's yeah, crazy. Just it's, it's ridiculous. And it, like wow. it's literally it is a sport. And meanwhile, um, I see videos of people dying on Instagram, exactly. getting murdered with millions of views. Exactly. But you can't post a photo of you shooting right. at a range. Right. <laughs> yes. Crazy. Um, you mentioned the homeless homelessness problem earlier. People are suffering. Yeah. Um, I just went to San Francisco and San Diego. Terrible. Yeah. It's really bad. Yeah. I was in San Diego, uh, I think a couple of months ago. Um, we were down there visiting the border. It's, it, that's a whole issue there in, in uh, California that doesn't get enough attention. Mm. When we think about the border crisis and massive influx of illegal immigration, it's, it's usually Texas and Arizona. Mm-hmm. Also, it's also happening there in San Diego, both through the mountains as well as um, in that dense urban corridor around the the coastal communities. But um, we went into downtown San Diego while we were there, and I was uh, I actually went and stopped and talked with um, people who were living in some of these tent cities. Mm. And there's tent cities, yeah, all over the place. This wow. this this one particular one that I went to was right on the side of uh, near the fencing along the highway. And so there were at least 20 tents that were set up right there. And mm. um, I was walking through with uh, a guy who was a retired, uh, actually, no, he, yeah, he was a retired police chief, but now he's back doing community relations, I think, for the police department there. Mm. But he spends time and talks to these guys every day and obviously trying to get them help or get them services or, or whatever he can do. But I, I talked to this guy. He's like, yeah, you know, I went to uh, law school. Uh, my mom used to work for so and so congressman. Mm-hmm. Uh, my brother runs a really successful business, and and it's just you know you actually go and spend time with people. Um, it 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 is heartbreaking to see. Yes, some of this has to do with drug addiction and substance abuse. Right. Others is like I just can't afford it. Um, but these these are these are our neighbors and neighbors family and friends in some cases. Um, but, but to see how this is, I mean, this is rampant in Hawaii. This is rampant, not only in big cities, but increasingly in, in small towns. Mm. Uh, and, and again, lack of affordable housing, a lot of substance abuse and addiction. And, and the fact that we have, you know, uh, an opioid crisis, big pharma in many cases perpetrating this, we have a corrupt FDA system, right? Uh, there are so many different contributing factors to this, and we don't have real leadership in place that's looking to how do we deal with the root cause mm. of these challenges. 
do you think there's a misuse of government funds with the homelessness problem? Because you see these crazy large budgets, especially in California. California is huge. See, you don't see any results. No, no. And and this, I mean, and, and this is important in this case, but but I would make this same statement across every government agency that we as taxpayers are funding. Where mm. are your metrics of success? Where are your metrics of performance and effectiveness? How are our taxpayer dollars being used to actually solve this problem rather than just to feed into either a bureaucracy or in the case of of so many of these cities dealing with uh, homeless crises, it's an industry now for nonprofits who make millions, tens of millions of dollars. If if they actually got people off the street and into homes, then they they should be working themselves out of a job. Right. That should be their goal. But instead, you see tens, hundreds of millions of dollars going to these same entities. It's the same thing at the border, by the way. There's a, there's a whole industry around the border with nonprofits who are are processing illegal immigrants through uh, who are who you know CEOs of these nonprofits making mm. over a million dollar salaries. Wow. It's insane. That's crazy. But again, it goes back to these are our taxpayer dollars that are being used in every one of these examples. Where's the accountability? Why don't we have watchdogs accounting for every penny that's being spent and recognizing as you would in a business, hey, mm. if we're trying this new uh, process or this new route or this new project, you want to know like, hey, is this working? Is there potential for this right. to work? If not, we got to shut this down and try something else. We don't have that. And and this is why one of the reasons why uh, we, we find ourselves con- continuously seeing these problems grow mm-hmm. instead of actually being addressed. And uh, the, it, the Democrats answer is like, we'll just throw more money at it. We'll throw more money at it. Uh, and meanwhile, again, it goes back to like, well, you're you're telling people they got to pay more taxes. It's making their lives harder, and you're not actually even solving the problems that you claim to be trying to solve. Yeah, yeah, it kind of furiates me because I paid millions in taxes, right? And who knows where that went? Who knows <laughs> where it goes? And and this is the problem with this mentality that exists largely within the Democratic Party. You know, th- there there are issues in the Republican Party as well with with you know out of control spending in some areas, especially when it comes to war and the military industrial complex, but. Uh, there's a sense of entitlement that the government deserves our taxpayer dollars Mm. rather than the other way around where our government should be existing, recognizing, you know, the the limited role that government should play in our lives Mm -hmm. and trying to be as as, uh, efficient and effective uh, custodians of taxpayer dollars uh, and that they work for us, not the other way around. Right. I wish they viewed it that way, yeah. That's the problem. And it's a problem both with politicians, but a lot of the bureaucracies and the bureaucrats who work there as well. Absolutely. So you mentioned the border a few times. Yeah. Uh, I had Tim Kennedy on last week. He said he could literally see people walking over. Yeah. Is it that bad? It is. I I lost count of how many people I saw in California. Um, We had had, uh, people who live near the border where we were uh, coming out and saying, like, basically border patrol is is like a— very well dressed, uniformed version of Uber for mm. these illegal immigrants who are. And I talked to some of the the illegal immigrants who are coming across the border, and a lot of them were very open to talking. Really? Yep. Nothing so they to were just hide. Over, they right? were walking over. They were looking for border patrol. They what? wanted uh, that. That surprised me too. <laughs> <laughs> I thought like, okay, well, they're going to be trying to well, evade, yeah. and you know, you hear about all the gotaways and all of this and that. No. It's, it's a well-oiled machine that the cartel is profiting from mm. where people will, if they're not coming from Mexico, they're flying in from all over the world, flying into places like Tijuana and Mexicali, mm-hmm. literally walking across the border and going to these known locations that they know where to go and Border Patrol knows where to go to pick people up. What? And they'll sit there playing on their phones. They got snacks. Uh, they're like, all right, we'll sit here. Maybe it'll take a few hours. Maybe it'll take a little longer, but we'll sit here until Border Patrol comes with their vans and loads them up in the van, takes them to a processing center, uh, does what they need to do there. Uh, you know, supposedly they try to check IDs. There are a lot of IDs and passports that we found destroyed along. You, I couldn't take two steps without seeing another passport or form of identification, either half burned or torn to pieces wow. next to the border. Uh, and then in a lot of cases, within 24 hours, 
These people are coming in. They're claiming asylum. They get a piece of paper that says, okay, you came in, you're claiming asylum, and you will have some court date at some point in the future, in many cases, years in the future, and they get a plane ticket to go wherever they want in the country. What? That, that, is, that, is, that is what is going on. And I saw groups of 5, 10, 20. We came across, literally just driving down this road, we came across a group of close to 300 illegal immigrants sitting very um, organized in rows. Everybody was quite calm, mm -hmm. literally just waiting. And there were two Border Patrol agents there watching them until van after van after van came and, uh, and picked them up. That's mind-blowing. Yeah. I can't believe it's that easy. I asked them, like, hey, you know, there are pe people there from Brazil. Where are you going? Oh, we're going to Boston. Uh, asked another family, where are you going? Oh, we're going to Texas. Another guy's like, oh, I'm going to Utah. <laughs> Holy crap. It's, it is out of control. It is out of control. And, and it is what an open border looks like. Right. Where you can. And, and the, here, here's the thing, though, is when you look at, you look at people who are actually trying to follow the rules— our immigration laws need to be fixed. There's no question about yeah. that. They are archaic and and uh, bureaucracy have it is it is a horrible system. It's slow. It took my friend's mother 25 years. Yeah, exactly. What to get a green card? Yeah, yeah. And it's insane. Even a tourist visa, though. I have a friend who has served in the army for over 30 years. Uh, he's a special forces guy, at Green Beret, finally retiring, and uh, his wife's sister and her family. They live in Italy. Mm. Um, they applied for a tourist visa to come to the U.S. for two weeks to go and attend his retirement ceremony. It's a huge, huge milestone in their family's life. Right. Denied. Damn. They got he's sharp. Her and her husband. They got jobs. They got kids in school. They've got a place to live. Obviously, they have a life there. Denied. Tourist app, tourist visa for two weeks. That's crazy. And that's the insane thing is you look at that versus like, well, maybe they should just fly into Tijuana and walk across the border. Go attend the ceremony and then leave. Mm. Way easier. Apparently. Yeah, why would you wait years? And this, this again, like I go back to Kamala Harris's speech last night because this is what we're going to continue to see over these next couple of months. She's talking about how she is going to secure our border in her speech last night. Mm. I'm going to secure our border. That was her first job as vice president <laughs> that Biden gave her was to secure the border. Yeah. That was three and a half years ago. And this border has been wide open this entire time. She is responsible for that. Mm. Tens of millions, apparently. Tens of millions. And, you know, President Trump was at the border uh, yesterday in Arizona, and mm. he met the parents of a uh, and, and gave them the microphone to speak for their 12-year-old daughter named Jocelyn, who was viciously <laughs> strangled to death, murdered, by a group of illegal immigrants from Venezuela who wow. had gone through this process, came in illegally, gone through the process, and were set out on the streets. Mm. Terrible. This is a consequence of open borders. Yeah, there's a lot of downsides. Do you think there's any truth to the Democrats wanting these illegals coming in to vote? Yes. Yes. You think that's actually true? Uh, if, if, you, if you add like one plus one plus one, <laughs> When you do the math and connect the dots, they have an open border policy. Kamala Harris said last night she wants to give amnesty to every single illegal immigrant in the country, mm. the tens of millions who have come in just during their administration alone. You have members of Congress saying, hey, we want more illegal immigrants in our districts because we need them for redistricting mm. to keep their congressional district in the hands of Democrats. And, and then you couple that with the fact that they are adamantly opposed to any kind of voter ID being required for voting. They are adamantly opposed, just recently fought hard against a Republican uh, bill that would have required proof of citizenship to vote. Wow. And, um, and, and you see in some places, like San Francisco and others, where they are uh, issuing driver's licenses and uh, allowing illegal immigrants, non-citizens to vote in local elections. Mm. So there is no other conclusion that one could logically come to other than to say, well, obviously they see this as a net positive and they see all of these people as, as either current or future voters. Right, because these new people are not aware of the corruption going on. Uh, no. 
maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, but but I have a feeling they probably see like, hey, we're here because of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's open border. Right. So they just vote. For I them. think that's probably the assumption that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the Democrats right. are making. That's actually really concerning because that that might win some states. With it's their extremely concerning. It's extremely concerning, and and it's illegal. Mm. Damn, they need to fight against that. Yes. Oh man. And this is this is where just you know watching very very closely um, how this election is is going to be run is is critical. Right. Absolutely critical. Um, so Trump's first term, he didn't start any wars. He seemed pretty anti-war as a former veteran. Uh, how does that make you see uh, like you saw the battlefield and everything? What's yeah. your stance on future wars? Yeah. I mean, I still serve. I'm, I'm in the army still oh, going nice. over 21 years. Um, you know, I, I've deployed twice the Middle East, uh, to East Africa, different war zones in different parts of the world and, uh, have seen the cost of war, um, and understand in a, in a very deeply visceral and personal way having lost people who I care very much about uh, and so many of our brothers and sisters who I may never have met but who um, sacrifice everything in service. And it for me, it's why I ran for office in the first place. It's why I ran for Congress. Um, coming back from my first deployment to Iraq in 2005 and seeing how many politicians, frankly, didn't give a about who was paying the price for their decision wow. to send us to war. That they're thinking about their friends in the military industrial complex or they're doing this because we got to look tough, but not actually going through the important um, analysis and thought process that must occur before you make that very serious decision. War should always be a last resort. Mm. Exhaust all diplomatic means to achieve peace, to achieve uh, understanding, to achieve like mutual interest, to work out differences, whatever that situation or the case may be, war should be considered as a last resort. Right. Uh, President Trump showed that through his first term. Um, I've had conversations with him about this and it's something that he takes very seriously. Mm -hmm. You compare and contrast that with what Kamala Harris and Joe Biden have done over the last four years where now we are on the brink of multiple regime change wars in different parts of the world, closer to World War III and nuclear war, especially nuclear war now than we ever have been before. According to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, we are closer, you know, they set that doomsday clock every year. Mm. We are closer to midnight, which is destruction of the world now than we ever have been before. And wow. that is not because, oh, well, some bad guy did something somewhere. No, this is a direct consequence of the Biden-Harris foreign policy mm. that has put us in this place of extreme risk and great danger. Uh, and so, yeah, for me as a soldier, as a veteran, it is very real and it's, it's very personal. Uh, who our commander-in-chief is, th that's, that's the most important responsibility that a president has. Mm. And this is why, again, as we head into this next election, Kamala Harris is someone who is weak and insecure as a person. And the danger that I see is that if she is elected president, like many weak and insecure politicians have proven to us in the past, she will try to mask that weakness by deploying us, my brothers and sisters in uniform, mm -hmm. to war and dropping bombs as a means for her to prove her strength. Mm -hmm. The cost of that is incalculable. And to have a person in that position, um, knowing that they have nuclear weapons at their fingertips. Uh, to say that it is incredibly dangerous is an understatement. Right. Russia, China. Plus, plus, she doesn't have the backbone or the strength or the courage to stand up to the military industrial complex. Mm. Uh, and those who are the warmongers who've been calling the shots under this administration for this, for their entire administration over the last three and a half years. 
uh, this this is a very real issue, and again, yet another huge point of contrast between her versus President Trump, who has seen that strength of the warmongers, the military-industrial complex, the deep state, the national security state. He's experienced much of the weaponization of these entities against him because they know that he won't bend the knee right. to them, uh, and, and that's why they see him as the biggest threat. And he is intent on rooting out those who are abusing their power and the corruption uh, if he is elected president again. Absolutely. I'd rather have Trump negotiate with Putin than Kamala. Yep. Imagine her trying to talk with him. I can't. <laughs> it, it, it would not be good. Be it would not end well. Oh, man. <laughs> for us. Yeah, it'd be bad. Do you think nuclear war is a possibility, though? It is a very, unfortunately, we are in a place where it is... Uh, a very real potential. Oh my gosh. Uh, and, and and it may be because of an intentional launch, or it may be because of a um, error, mm. a miscommunication, a misreading of signals. And uh, in either case, the fact that we are at at such a point where a spark, literally a spark, could uh, be the thing that launches a nuclear war, that would result in World War the, III. well, no, it, it would, it would be a consequence of World War III. But a nuclear war is something that will destroy the world. Wow, it will destroy the world. There, there is no. Then this is where Ronald Reagan was very prescient and correct and powerful when he said a nuclear war cannot be won, and should never be fought. Mm. And the dangerous thing now is, is you will hear these warmongers on television. And some of these politicians talking about nuclear war and nuclear weapons as though it's just like some other kind of new missile or some other kind of new bomb right. that they have at their fingertips to use against those who they see as adversaries or enemies. Yeah, that is such a danger. They throw it around like it's nothing and that there will be no consequence. Oh, we, we have these, you know, these, these small nukes, these tactical nukes. We'll just launch one of those, and and then send a strong message. That's what they always say. We'll send a strong message. You really think that that's not going to invoke a response? Right. Like, it's it's so... I can't even say it's naive. Mm. It's dangerously stupid. Yeah. And they're and they're they are the ones making these statements from from a place where they know that, well, they've got bunkers. They, they've got places they can go and hide out. There is no shelter... There is no means to survive for the rest of us mm. at all. There's a, a, a book that a woman named Annie Jacobson just wrote about nuclear war that mm. goes into detail in all of this. Uh, and, and it is incredibly disturbing and eye-opening uh, to, to look at what she details in the actions that a president uh, must take mm -hmm. and will take uh, in the event of a nuclear war and what the consequences are. Really? Yes. You gotta check that book out. I highly recommend it. Is it true they have a button they click? President? Uh, physically, you should read the book. Okay. You should read. You should have her on your show. I've heard of her actually. Yeah. If she's been on um, some podcasts. There, before. there are you know there there are many layers to this system, um, but there are um, there is often minutes to make this decision wow yeah like and if it's past, seven minutes it's to make this PM, decision biden won't uh won't answer yeah, right <laughs> exactly crazy yeah. i saw his working hours i couldn't believe it yeah if you're president yeah i mean you should be available to well, it, it is your job 24 yeah. 7 whole countries yeah counting on you yeah it's unreal um speaking of biden though you endorsed him in 2020 yeah when did you start realizing that might have been the wrong idea I mean, I already had concerns. You know, I I, I ran against the guy right. <laughs> in that primary. <laughs> uh, but at that time, you know, he was, uh, I mean, he was essentially the presumptive Democratic nominee. And what I, the reason why I did it, really the only reason why I did it was because I saw it as perhaps my only opportunity to be able to uh, exercise any kind of influence over him should he be elected mm. to encourage him to um, listen to his better angels, to not fall to the influence of 
the neocon warmongers not fall to um, those those uh, dark forces who seek to divide our country and and to destroy right our country. So you did it good heartedly. Yeah, and, and it's just you know, unfortunately, um, he did exactly what I was worried he would do. Right from the get go, from day one. Wow, his inauguration speech uh, was incredibly divisive, mm. and uh, everything that happened since has only further driven that wedge of divisiveness, trying to tear us apart so that they can amass more power, taking away more of our freedom so they can amass more power. Uh, that, that is exactly what he's done. And that's how they try to paint Trump as divisive. And that's their trick. You know, you hear Kamala Harris talking about defending freedom while she's taking away our freedom. Right. They criticize President Trump as being a threat to democracy while they are literally undermining our democracy they try to take Trump off the ballot in over 32 states to make it so voters couldn't even make their own choice. Mm. Thankfully, the Supreme Court stopped them and said, no, you don't get to choose. Voters get to choose. You don't get to just say, well, we want to take this guy's name off the ballot. Right. That's not how this works. They have obviously, you know, been waging lawfare and trying to keep Trump tied up in courtrooms and they still want to throw him in a prison cell yep. uh, over all these different trumped up charges. Uh, they have been waging this... Um, undermining our democracy on so many levels while saying that they are the defenders of democracy. Kamala Harris said last night she believes in the rule of law while they are actively and have been for the last three and a half years undermining the rule of law. <laughs> in every one of these cases, this is like a tried and true tactic. Say one thing to cover up the fact that you're doing the exact opposite. Crazy. And that's what's happening. It is. Was there any sign of cognitive decline in Biden in the 2020 debates? I didn't see it. Okay. I didn't see it. And I've known him for a long time. Um, you know, we had conversations, uh, you know, before and after you know, each of those debates. And uh, you look at the side-by-sides of, of his last debate with President Trump and his debates in 2020, and they're vastly, vastly different. Mm. Um, I think the fact that um, both Kamala Harris and everyone around Joe Biden covered up the truth uh, about his condition for these last three and a half years, all because they thought he was the best horse who would help them win, uh, is 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 sick and disgusting, and has has been uh, a huge deception right. to voters that and the American people. That's that's a big deal, you know. Well, they should be held to account for it. Like the, he clearly was struggling for years. Yeah, and they were hiding it. Yeah, and and you know, when the 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 whole point of a democracy is. You know, we as voters get to cast our votes for the elected leaders that we can then hold accountable. But when you have someone who has clearly for these last four years been controlled by unelected, nameless, faceless people, mm -hmm. how do we hold them accountable? Right. Yeah. That's the position that we're in. I'm still trying to figure out who these faceless, nameless people are. I know who some of them are. Oh yeah, you probably <laughs> met some of them. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, there's you know, there there are people who are around them. You know, there's Jake Sullivan is Biden's national security advisor. Mm -hmm. You know, there's Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, and you know, there's there's there are some of these very well known faces, and then you have others who are behind the curtain within, you know, what is is can only be called the deep state. That used to be such like a conspiratorial term, but right. it, it's actually a real thing. Yeah. Well, Biden's not calling the shots. <laughs> well, the, he's not. He's clearly not, and he hasn't been for quite some time. And when people ask, like, well, what is the deep state? Um, we have administrators, bureaucrats, big money people, powerful people in the media, powerful people in all of these different sectors who are pulling the strings and moving the chess pieces and calling the shots behind the scenes to benefit their ability to remain in power. Yeah. So when people are like, what is this, you know, I don't know, whatever image people come up with their in their minds about the deep state, uh, you know, like from the movies, a bunch of guys with like cigar smoke <laughs> in a dark room somewhere yeah. or whatever. But um, this is this is happening in real time. We are living through this. Oh, absolutely. Right now. And we are suffering the consequences of it, most yep. importantly. Because I've had on controversial people mm -hmm. and I've had some phone calls where I could hear someone recording it. Interesting. It's pretty crazy. Interesting. Like it's not a coincidence. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like certain people I'll have on the show and 
you know, our texts are being monitored. It's it's unreal. Yeah. They might be monitoring your texts. We don't I even would know. not be surprised. I, I, I honestly assume that they are. I and, assume. And the fact, the fact that they just put me, and this is the thing, man, like what, 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 what could be a bigger betrayal for, you know, like I said, I've worn the uniform for over 21 years. I put my life on the line for my country. I joined the military because of the terrorist attacks on 9-11 mm. to go after those guys who attacked us on that day, go after these Islamist terrorists who continue to pose a threat to us today. Mm. And now my own government has put me on a domestic terror watch list. Mm. I, I, to my knowledge, you know, yeah, I'm sure they, they are surveilling my movements uh, I assume, yeah, are they watching my text? And this is the thing is, is how do you live free in a supposedly free society in the United States of America when there's this constant stress and pressure of wondering, you know, if or how my government is watching me, surveilling me, trying to find an opportunity to do what Stalin's security chief did mm. when he said, show me the man and I'll show you the crime. Right. They will find any way they can to weaponize our whole ju judicial system and our law enforcement and the national security state to go after and target those that they deem a threat. Absolutely. This is this is the world that we're living with under the Harris-Biden administration. And if Kamala Harris is elected as president, we will not only see this continue, it will get worse because as she says in her own words, she is and will be the prosecutor president. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And they're covering up so much, too. We still don't know what the assassination attempt will happen. No. Like, we should know why he did that, who he was. Nothing came out. I just saw this morning on the news here that uh, I think there were five or six Secret Service agents that, that have been put on uh, some kind of administrative leave because of an investigation that's going on. Whoa. Uh, but why why is this taking so long? Right. It's been a month. Yeah. And and yeah. how how many headlines... Uh, you know, are, are are still talking about the fact that we almost had a former president and the Republican nominee for this election assassinated. The only reason he wasn't assassinated is he turned his head right. at the last second. How long did that last? That Those headlines lasted, what, a couple of days, maybe? And what's being done about it? Why isn't the entire United States Congress in outrage about this? Mm -hmm. It happened right before they went on their annual August recess why don't, they, why don't well, it, this seems serious to me? Mm. They should be taking it seriously. Why don't they call everybody back in right. and actually uh, make sure that that investigation is, takes place immediately because he's still out there. Just yesterday, there was he when he was there at the border in Arizona, they had to rush him out of there again, really, because there was a guy in the area who was making threats on his life again. What? Holy crap. That's crazy. This is not so this is this is this is continuing and right. it's ongoing and they still haven't gotten to the bottom of of all of those failures and all of all of those vulnerabilities um that existed that allowed that shooter to get up on that roof there uh in Pennsylvania. Right. And on Twitter I'm seeing all this evidence and just nothing's happening. No. They they geo tracked his phone and so Well you had you had you had freaking the director of the FBI I think it was maybe a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago, uh, but but certainly a few weeks after the the uh, a couple of weeks after the assassination attempt, the director of the FBI sat before Congress and looked them in the face and said, "We still don't know if it was a bullet that hit Trump or a piece of shrapnel." It's crazy. I don't believe that he doesn't know. Yeah, that guy needs to resign. Just like the he he, he should have been fired a long time ago. Uh, but the fact that he's using his position as director of the FBI, why would he say, first of all, why would he say that? Mm. What does the FBI always say? I can't comment because of an ongoing investigation. Right. Right? That's their, that's their throwaway line to get away from having to answer questions all the time. Mm -hmm. Why would he not say that in this case? Mm. Good point. I can tell you why. Is because President Trump went directly into the Republican convention after the assassination attempt. Mm. We saw a surge in Americans who recognized the seriousness of what had just occurred and how he reacted in, frankly, exhibiting a kind of strength and leadership that a lot of people under, literally under fire, would not have shown. Right. Uh, and, and he started to see a, a surge of, of support for his candidacy. 
Uh, it brought a lot of people together in the country. The only reason why the FBI director would say that when clearly, clearly, the evidence already existed to show that President Trump was hit by a bullet in an assassination attempt, the only reason he would say that is to try to cast doubt in people's minds about President Trump's integrity and about whether or not this was as serious uh, 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 a situation mm. as it actually was. Wow. Trying to, like, all right, we got to do something about this guy. He's, he's getting way too much support now. Let's send out the FBI director and start to plant some seeds of doubt in people's minds. Mm. Yeah, they know how to program people's minds. Yeah. Crazy. And this, I mean, you know, e within a day or so, uh, other people in the FBI went back in and had to clean up Christopher Ray's mess. And they're like, well, no, we do know it was a bullet. But the fact that he took that opportunity to use that platform in front of Congress to make that statement points to, again, how far they're willing to go to try to uh, to try to stay in power. Because that's, that's, that's what this is about. Yeah, and Google censored. You couldn't even look up exactly. the assassination attempt. Exactly. It just seems so, like, planned. Like, did you see <laughs> DJT got shorted the stock by some $12 million short? I did not see that. Before. No, I did not see that. Yeah, the day before. Wow. So was that a coincidence too? Like there's just so many things that yeah. happened. Yeah. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. Scary times. So we got to we'll keep our eyes open. Yeah, we do. It's been an honor. I'd love to end Thank off with you. your book and uh, where can people find the book? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I this this book is called For Love of Country, Leave the Democrat Party Behind. And uh, I left the Democratic Party a couple of years ago. Um, and I go into, in each chapter in this book, really the, the detailed reasons of why I left the Democratic Party and the experiences that, that I had had. Um, I served in Congress for eight years. I was a vice chair of the Democratic National Party. Uh, I ran for president in the Democratic primary in 2020. And uh, through, through all of my experiences, really going through the details of of how insane today's Democratic Party has become and how in so many ways uh, they are trying to undermine our freedom, our constitution, and the very fabric of our society. The reality is that today's Democrat Party is led by this elitist cabal of woke warmongers who are doing everything that they possibly can to destroy all that we who truly love this country care about. And as, as depressing as that can be and mm -hmm. as, hopeless, as hopeless as um, our situation and our future can seem at times, uh, the, the call to action really at the end of the book is, is about what we can do, mm -hmm. each of us as individuals, to save our country and why we, ha we can't waste time. We have to take action to do that. And this is the beauty of, of our founders vision for our country is they recognize that, um, you know, the, the temptation of those in power to abuse their power so that they can stay in power, which is why they set up our constitution and our system of government the way that it is to have three co-equal branches of government, to have that check on the balance of power and to ensure that ultimately our government exists with the consent of the governed. Mm. They envisioned a government of, by, and for the people. If we don't have a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, we're the only ones who can fix that and change that. And so as we head into this election, November 5th is election day. Voting is going to start, I think, in less than a month mm. uh, in, in, uh, in September in some states. Uh, keep that in mind. We are the only ones who can bring about this change. You may not be, you may not have the candidate of your dreams to choose from. You may not be feeling completely inspired, or maybe you are. The, the, we have to be very pragmatic and realistic about where we are as a country and the fact that there is a very clear choice between us uh, in the candidates running for president. And, uh, Kamala Harris, a vote for Kamala Harris is a vote for an increasingly tyrannical government that takes away our freedoms, that has destroyed our, our ability to live in a free, peaceful, and prosperous society, and has pushed us closer to the brink of nuclear war and annihilation than ever before. 
a vote for Donald Trump is a vote for someone who really believes in America's potential and our ability to live in a truly free, peaceful, and prosperous society. Mm. And uh, who has shown through his record before um, his ability to stand up to the military-industrial complex and his commitment to walk us back from the brink of war because he knows, as we should all know, that we cannot be truly prosperous unless we are at peace and we are free. Right. I love that. Simple. Simple enough, right? That's it. Seems like an easy vote to me. Uh, we'll link the Amazon and Audible below. Can, yep, absolutely. Cool. I recorded the audiobook, and uh, I tell a lot of stories in there about my experiences that that uh, people probably haven't heard anywhere else. And, and I think it'll be a very eye-opening thing to see what goes on behind the curtains. Amazing. Can't wait to listen to it. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Good to see you. Honor. Yep. Thanks for watching, guys. As always, I'll see you next time.